All right, everyone, I'd like to present to you Keith Delaplane. If you'd like to go ahead and tell us about yourself. Okay, well, thank you for, for um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be on your speaker's program in these unusual times. Uh, I, I know we all look forward to the day that we can do these kind of meetings face to face again. Um, but I'm happy I can be here tonight. So um, thank you for, for joining me. I'm going to talk this evening about a, a topic that has been um, my central focus of research for about the last six years now, ever since I did a sabbatical in, in England in 2012 and 13, I, I, I started studying honeybee queen multiple mating. And I found it to be a really um, understudied, uh, underappreciated, and underutilized aspect in uh, honeybee breeding. Uh, I think probably I would take a bet that everyone listening to my voice tonight probably agrees that it'd be a nice thing if we wouldn't have to rely on chemicals and acaricides in our beehives. Um, we all, I think, share the wish that we could have honeybees that are genetically uh, resistant to basically all of the modern stressors that they're having to deal with. Uh, this is a good and noble goal, and I consider this research a part of that overall program. But I have also enjoyed studying the honeybees' multiple mating habit because it's, it's tied into some really fundamental natural history of the bee. Uh, it is not an overstatement to say that the queen's habit of mating with multiple males in no small way makes the honeybee colony what it is. Um, one of my interesting lectures I, I enjoy talking about is the social evolution of bees and how uh, the honeybee lineage went from a solitary mother to her solitary mother and one or two daughters to uh, a solitary mother and a bunch of daughters and all the way up the chain to we have the complex eusocial colony that we have today. And I'm going to touch briefly this evening about the critical role that honeybee queen multiple mating had in that long evolutionary history. It is quite simply impossible to have the honeybee that we know today without it. Honeybee queen multiple mating is crucial and central uh, to the biology of the bee. If you read some of the uh, traditional honeybee and bee breeding literature, uh, some of the old classic texts from the 20th century, I'm thinking um, like Roger Morse, How to Raise Queen Honeybees. Uh, he wrote a really important book in the 1980s with that title. Steve Tabor uh, is another big name in the honeybee breeding uh, literature. And if you pull their books off the shelf and you kind of thumb through them again, you find that they do acknowledge honeybee queen multiple mating, but it's almost treated in an apologetic sense. And if I can paraphrase, it, it sort of goes like this. You know, here you are, uh, Mr. or Ms queen breeder, and you are selecting for something. There's a character in honeybees that you want to select and propagate. Um, let's say it's mite resistance. So you're out there and you're sampling bees and you're sampling mites, and out of your whole population, you take your 10% best queens. Uh, in this case, they had the lowest mite counts in your entire operation, and you're going to propagate from that top 10% and you're going to um, get your cell starters, you're going to graft those larvae, you're gonna put them in the wax cups, you're gonna put them in the bars, you're gonna put them in the cell starter, you're gonna pull them out after 24 hours, you're gonna put them in a finisher and, and then pull them out and put them in your incubator at the perfect timing so they don't emerge and kill each other. And, and you're gonna take those ripe cells and you're gonna put them in the mating nukes. And then what? Oh gosh. They're gonna fly out and they're gonna mate with whatever males are out there. So you go through all this work for 50% of the genetics that you're hoping to capture. And when it comes to the paternal side of that equation, um, the classical bee books basically wring their hands and say, yeah, we're sorry, it's a very inefficient process, but you know, there you go, that's the way it is with the honeybee. We can't help it, 
you know, the queens multiply mate. Now we might have some control over that process if we flood our mating yards with drones and drone producing colonies. In fact, this is um, standard procedure for, for many, many breeders uh, just to sort of help um, control that paternal side. Uh, a lot of the breeders will actively select for the paternal line just as vigorously as they select for the maternal line. And this is certainly a step in the right direction, but none of us can pretend that the honeybee mating system is easy to control, uh, especially if it's just natural and unassisted uh, with any instrumental insemination or, or anything that we may bring to it. So yes, bee breeding is not easy. It, it's a hard enterprise and traditionally multiple mating has been considered a part of the problem. Well, I hope to change your minds on that issue tonight because um, there's a great deal of evidence accumulating that not only is honeybee queen multiple mating just a, a part of the uh, strategy that honeybees use to resist diseases and pathogens and parasites, it's crucial to that strategy. It's not accidental, it's central to the honeybee's natural strategy for trying to use genetics to solve its problems. So I think uh, we, as beekeepers who are looking for genetics to solve our problems, uh, this is probably something we should pay attention to. So with that, I'm going to launch into uh, some research that I've been doing with uh, Debbie Delaney. I think many of you know Debbie. She's been quite active in your state doing research and extension work. And uh, Debbie was my collaborator for the project that I'll be talking about tonight. So I'm gonna talk about that research. I'm gonna talk about some of the natural history of the honeybee leading up to that. And um, so for that, I'm going to, uh, here we go. Oh, come on, I have trouble sometimes. There we go, it's advancing. Yeah, right. This is the complete honeybee phylogeny. Um, it goes back to, uh, 1.4 billion years ago. Now, take a breath. I'm not going to go back 100, you know, 140 million years, uh, but I am just going to point out a few um, big moments in evolution, if you will, in the honeybee. And let's begin at the top row. You see that the very first top row on the left, we see the three main domains of life on this planet. The archaea, which are the primitive bacteria, which do not have nucleus or nuclei in their cells. And then the eubacteria, these are the advanced bacteria, the single cells who do have nuclei in their cells. And then we have the eukarya, which are the multicellular organisms. They're not just individual cells, they're cells that have come together uh, to form an organism. Now, it may be interesting to all of us uh, tonight to reflect on the fact that um, some taxonomists are considering admitting a fourth domain into the tree of life, and that would be occupied by the viruses. Uh, yes, some of you should be raising your hands. Uh, there's been a long-term debate whether viruses even qualify as living entities. But that debate has been fuzzy for a long time, in part because there's evidence for both, right? And so there is a active area of research that is uh, suggesting that we elevate the viruses to their own individual domain. But that has nothing else to do with what we're talking about tonight. So let's move across that top row. And you see about in the, oh, about 195 million years ago, we see the arrival of the wasp-waisted hymenopterans. Now the hymenoptera, which are the order that contains all of the ants and the uh, wasps and the bees, actually gets its beginning at about 300 million years ago. You see there the arrival of the hymenoptera. But let's zoom in a little closer and the wasp wasted ones are those that have constricted abdomens and this is a primitive trait um, originally evolved for being good parasites and the majority of wasps to this day are parasitic. Um, these are your real champions in your home garden. 
Uh, these tiny itsy bitty micro hymenoptera, we call them. Some of them are the size of gnats. But these are the real workhorses that are controlling the caterpillars and the herbivores in your gardens. Um, those of you who have seen those big green tomato hornworms that have these white cocoons sprouting out of their backs, those cocoons are the, are the cocoons of a microhymenopteran, an itsy bitsy tiny little wasp that parasitizes these caterpillars and controls them. So these, these microhymenoptera are worth billions of dollars economically for the natural background pest control they cause. But what they have in common with the honeybee is that wasp waste. Now you notice there about year 175 million years ago, there on the far right on the top row, we have the arrival of the aculeata. And the aculeata are the so-called hunting wasps. And these are the wasps that have abandoned parasitism in preference of just outright predation. These are carnivores. These are your yellow jackets, your hornets, the large wasps that most of us uh, think of today. Um, they retained the constricted wasp waste, only now they use it to more effectively swivel their abdomen around and paralyze their prey, which they then take back to their nest and chew it up into a mass mess and feed that to their larvae. Wasps are fundamentally carnivores. Okay, moving down to the bottom row now, we see the aculeata reemerging there on the far left. And now take a look at that green oval that occupies about 100 to 140 million years ago. This is the arrival of the angiosperms, the flowering plants. And so you know what's happening next. Uh, it's no accident that immediately following and during that radiation of the angiosperms, we have the arrival of the true bees at about 100 million years ago. And where did these come from? These came from carnivorous wasps. And this is just an interesting thing. Bees are fundamentally vegetarian wasps because here we had this ancient wasp predatory lineage that started exploiting this new source of protein which started showing up in their neighborhood in the form of the pollen that the angiosperms were producing. And so these carnivorous wasps just started collecting this pollen instead and eventually evolved adaptations on their bodies, such as the hind leg. You see that conspicuous wide uh, first foot segment? That's, that's common across all of the bees, which then later got co-opted into the pollen basket, which we see on the most advanced bees, uh, such as the stingless bees in South America, and the bumblebees, and of course, the honeybee. Right. Jump on to about 70 million years ago, we see the arrival of the tribe Apini, which contains the honeybees. Uh, hastening on, we see that red circle that occurs at about 20 to 30 million years ago. This is the arrival of eusociality. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then all the way to the right, we have our beloved Apis mellifera, and it, at the very, very end, I had to crunch the time scale on this phylogeny to make it all fit because so much of the evolution of Apis mellifera is very, very recent in terms of just tens of thousands of years ago. Just a blink of the eye in geologic time is where all of our different races of the honeybee um, have emerged. So this long history that I have just dashed through can, is, is, a, is a record of several evolutionary events where small units of biology lump together to form a larger unit, which then in turn lumps together to form yet a larger unit and a larger and a larger, all the way up to the organism, which is you and me, the multicellular organisms. All of them are cells that have come together diversified, specialized into organs, livers, lungs, hearts, brains, different body parts, and they all form one organism. But that's not the highest level of evolutionary transitions. I think we should all be proud to know that the honeybee occupies or represents that niche. And that is those organisms 
that have come together to form a larger entity, which then lives and reproduces and survives or fails to survive in its environment, just like any other organism down the chain, except that its units are made up with organisms. And of course, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about the worker bees uh, that are analogous to cells in a multicellular organism's body, but together they form the superorganism or the honeybee colony. Um, this is a simple scenario just to kind of talk about how all of that happened. We have on the far left a, a nest, a life history, typical of a solitary bee. And this, this category A remains true of the majority of bees to this day. The vast, vast majority of bees are still solitary. They live together as sing they live as a solo lone ranger. Here we have one female, she's dug a burrow. She has one little lateral burrow going off to the left in which there is a ball of pollen with an egg laid on it, and that's it. The most she might do is bury that, that cavity to provide some protection against parasites and predators, but there's no more uh, maternal care, and that larva consumes that pollen ball and emerges 12 uh, months later to emerge and start that cycle all over again. Very, very simple, truncated life history. Now in B, well, things are a little more interesting. We now have two individuals living in that burrow. And if you count the brood clumps, there is one brood clump for each female. So at this point, they're both reproducing. Um, they're roommates. They might be two unrelated females. They might be mother and daughter. They might be two sisters. At this stage, it doesn't really matter. And we do have species, modern species today, that occupy this niche. They are on the road to sociality, if you will. Now, point C on the far right, things have gotten more interesting again. We now have one, two, three, four, five females occupying one burrow, but this time we still have just two brood clumps. And this is telling us that someone is not reproducing. This is the first glimmer of division of labor. And yes, in C, we call this primitive sociality. So this is a step in that direction which got you know epitomized uh, in the honeybee. Um, these species are well represented. This is a species that's very common in Georgia. Uh, they're, act they're beginning to be active right now. But you have uh, these solitary individuals that nest together. They give the false appearance of a social colony but they're not. It's more like a neighborhood. Each one of those holes in the soil is a dead end. Uh, each one of them is the work of a single female. But yet the males congregate so they can try to harass and mate with the females. And the females like to congregate in the same neighborhood because it's sort of herd protection, if you will, against the parasites and predators. So even though they're not social, uh, they're, still, um, they're, they're still gregarious, I think is the word. They, they lump together. And this is that, that, that section C that I showed you in that previous illustration. You have you know, females nesting together and, and everyone is sort of you know, benefiting from the shared nest. But the next thing that happens is those that are reproducing and those that are not, the ones that are not reproducing, they, they kind of want to keep the status quo. It's like, you know, if I'm not going to reproduce, I don't want my roommate to reproduce either. Let's all just let mom reproduce just to keep things organized. And the way I'm going to keep that from you reproducing is I'm going to eat your eggs. This is called mutual policing. And this is what the daughters of a single mother do. And this is illustrated with honeybees because honeybees still do this, by the way. And we have a worker deposited egg in the top cell. And then you see the worker in the bottom cell has eaten that egg. She's removed it. So this is a way that honeybees even today keep their sisters from laying eggs. It's as if they're saying, you know what? If I'm not going to reproduce, you're not going to reproduce either. We're only going to let mom reproduce because that way we propagate our genes most effectively. Well, after so many lineages and generations of this, 
the females that are really good at reproducing and the females that are really good at tending the nest get to where their anatomy starts showing the difference. The workers, the daughters now that do the work, are starting to get more worker-like. They're more fuzzy. They have corbicula on their legs for carrying pollen. They have combs on their body for brushing the pollen off of their body. They have more intelligence. They have more decision-making power. They have better resources for orienting back home to their nest and got not getting lost. The queen loses these behaviors and morphologies. The queen is actually dumber than the workers. It's no accident that it's really the workers that call the shots in the modern honeybee colony. But once you reach the point where you have a worker bunch of females that all they can do is work and you have a reproducing group of females that all they can do is reproduce, we have crossed a critical threshold in evolution, which in the social insects we call the point of no return. Because this is a point at which the species has now taken that final step and committed to social life. They cannot go back. Once they have evolved morphological differences, the workers work and the reproducers reproduce, then now they need each other and they can only reproduce as a group. And when this has happened, this is called that final evolutionary transition to the superorganism. I've told you all of this to bring you to this point right here. Once we have morphologically different castes, and it's really only at this moment that we can now really start talking about queens and workers. Prior to this point, it was really just mothers and daughters, but once they get morphologically distinct, now we can start talking about queens and workers. And once they are morphologically distinct, the mother can now start practicing multiple mating. She never could have done this prior to this point because all of her daughters would have rebelled and they would have said, hey mom, you know, look, I will help you rear more of my full sisters, but I'm not going to help you rear half sisters, okay? But once they're morphologically distinct, the workers had no more say in the matter, if you will, and the mother was free to practice multiple mating. Um, why do this? Why, what, what's the advantage? Well, one thing, um, mating is extremely inefficient in the hymenoptera, and it still is. This is a behavior that has never really gotten more efficient in the evolutionary of the, of the order. The vast, vast, vast majority of sperm are lost in the mating process. It just runs right out the median oviduct and it's lost. But these multiple maters were able to gain an advantage with mating with many males because it allowed for a larger sperm load, which allowed for a larger population of daughters, which allowed for a more fit colony, which made the colony more fit, which provided feedback positive to the mother to practice multiple mating. Eventually, it was morphologically adapted into a spermatheca, which improved the efficiency of the sperm retention, but it is still far, far, far from efficient. And what you're seeing here is a cross-section of a honeybee queen spermatheca. That outer ring, you notice all those little black dots? Each one of those black dots is a cell nucleus. The honeybee queen spermatheca is only one cell thick. And that big tangled mess, it looks like a big ball of yarn inside the spermatheca, that is the sperm and the sperm tails. The honeybee male holds the distinction in the animal kingdom for having the longest known sperm tail. So there you go, another superlative uh, for the honeybees. When the queen has an egg coming down her median oviduct, she has muscular control over the spermathecal duct which she opens and she's quite liberal with the deposition of sperm. It's about five to 10 sperm are spent on every single egg that goes down her track. In spite of this, a queen virtually never runs out of semen. Even if she mates with only one male, she has enough sperm for her entire life. 
Uh, I know that's amazing, but um, it's true. So when we as beekeepers, we talk about a queen running out of sperm is, is really not true. You know, queens or, or, or drones are quite copious in their production of sperm. However, uh, in the era that we live in now, we are getting more and more evidence that the sperm count of drones is declining. So that may not continue to be true. Okay, we, we may be at a frontier where it, it might be possible for a queen to literally run out of sperm. So, you know, let's, let's, let's hold that dogma loosely, shall we say. But for our present purposes, the big advantage to honeybee queen multiple mating was economy of scale, grandness, if you will. Everything that we celebrate in the honeybee as beekeepers is only possible because of honeybee queen multiple mating. Um, it is no accident that the apex of the social insects is occupied only by these, those groups that practice uh, prodigious multiple mating. And, and I hate to burst any bubbles tonight, but the honeybee does not occupy that high point. Uh, the real grand champions of social complexity in biology belongs to the ants and the termites, in which we have multiple queens, not just one queen mated to multiple males, we have multiple queens, some of whom are multiply mated. And so we get huge genetic diversity inside these ant nests and populations measured in the millions but let's not go there. Let's just stay with the honeybees. The honeybees get big populations, right? You know, tens of thousands of individuals. That's not shoddy. But they also get that overwhelming repertoire of worker behaviors. Now, what you're seeing here is a graphic that shows the expected task distribution of a worker as it ages. And along the bottom there, you can see I have the ages, average ages of a worker bee as she grows older. And along the left axis, we see the category of tasks that she is expected to participate in. It begins up at the top with the youngest workers, cleaning cells, feeding brood. It's indoor types of things. They're feeding brood, capping brood, dealing with the cappings, attending to the queen, they're grooming. And you see how it moves slowly toward more exterior oriented tasks of ventilating, shaping, receiving nectar, and then finally guarding, and then finally, finally, foraging. Foraging is the end of the road. Uh, foraging is the, the terminal and lethal uh, task category. Nobody survives foraging, okay? This, this is the end of the rope for, for, for a worker. So this sequence is loosely governed by age. Um, you can tell how loose it is just by looking at those spreads, right? The variance is huge. The overlap is huge. Um, and this is a yet another way that honeybee evolution has, has tried to get diversity built into their structure. A young bee, for example, let, okay, let's say, for example, a colony loses all of its forager force due to a uh, field insecticide application. Instantly, there's no foragers. Well, the young workers are able to precociously jump forward and start doing foraging way in advance of what they normally would have done. The flip side of that, let's say that the foragers bring in a slow acting um, granular pesticide that gets contaminated in the pollen. And so it's all of your young demographic that dies. Well, the reverse is true. Old workers can regress. They can become young again. Fancy that, if we could put that in a bottle and sell it, right? They become young again. Their glands for feeding nurses reactivate and they can go back to nursing behavior. All of this is really cool and really interesting, but the real hook here is that the genetic inclinations to be a specialist, to linger in one of these tasks, to be able to jump ahead to an older one or to, or to go back to a younger one, these are under genetic influence that is usually regulated at the level of the subfamily. Which particular father do you come from? 
this is huge. This is really, really big. A lot of this genetic diversity that you're seeing in this graphic can be traced to which father you came from. We call these patrilines. These are all daughters who share one father in common. They all have the same mother in common. So the distinction is what, who's the different father. And these very often are how these genetic differences resolve. And the honeybee loves genetic diversity. In fact, it loves it so much. Let me show you a couple other ways it does. When, in, when animals form sperm or eggs, gametes, uh, sex cells, there's this peculiar little process called crossing over. And this happens in our testes and it happens in our ova in the formation of our reproductive cells. The, the chromosomes line up pair to pair with one another, as you see there in part A at the top. And then at B, those paired chromosomes cross their legs. You can almost hear a saxophone playing, can't you? It gets kind of a little steamy here, right? They cross their legs. Sections of those chromosomes disconnect and float. And then they float over and recombine with the paired chromosome in C and D. And then finally, those chromosome pairs separate altogether and go and form their respective sperm or egg. This crossing over dance that I just illustrated in here is extremely high in the honeybee, extremely high rates of crossing over. And it is yet one more bid in Apis mellifera for genetic diversity, a re-scrambling of the genes each generation. There's another way this happens, and this is in the drone congregation areas. What you're seeing here is a picture of an old friend of mine who's now quite elderly, but he's still alive. This is um, uh, Carl. Carl from, well, between, it's, 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 a, it's a question whether he lives in, um, in England or Wales. He lives literally right on the border. But Carl Scholler has made a lifelong hobby of tracking drone congregation areas. And he does this with a long cane fishing pole and he dangles a queen lure at the end of it, which is a piece of chalk painted black and soaked in uh, queens that he has collected over the years and stores in alcohol. So that their pheromone comes out in the alcohol, he soaks it into that piece of chalk and then he goes walking around and he tracks consistent drone congregation areas uh, for virtually all of his adult life. So Carl is, um, he's still alive. He's living in a nursing home now. And we've actually been trying to reach him recently, like in the last few weeks, we've tried to reach Carl to try to get some access to some of his data on drone congregation areas uh, so that it gets saved for science. Otherwise, we're afraid it may get lost. We know these drone congregation areas um, which are clouds of drones, which fly in a circuit around the landscape. These are drones from up to 200 different colonies, 200 different colonies. And the virgin queens seek out these drone congregation areas and they fly through them and they copulate in very quick succession, boom, 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 with males from many colonies. And so there you have it, yet another level at which Apis mellifera has contrived to have genetic diversity in its colonies, not genetic narrowness. Go back to some of my opening comments about traditional queen breeding and the way we as beekeepers traditionally go about it. We select a colony for a character that we like, we graft from that queen, and then we hope for the best when they mate. Any time that humans are engaged in selecting, we are selecting in a very micro time scale that is no longer than our own lifespans. And this means that we may succeed at whatever the character is that we're going for. But the question is, at what cost? This is the proverbial genetic bottleneck. When we have a human breeder who is subjecting his or her bee population to a narrow gap of selection, which is that breeder's selection criteria. And that is invariably done with less than full knowledge 
of what those bees are encountering in their daily habitat stressors. We may be selecting for varroa resistance when the real stressor in their environment is nutrient deprivation, or they may have some weird genetic anomaly that makes them forage on a really narrow range of plants and what they really need is more genetic diversity so that they forage for more plants. My, my point is we as human observers are always, and I don't mean sometimes, I mean always going to make selection mistakes because of our ignorance and our naivety of what other characters are out there in the breeding population that are of equal or greater importance than the character we're selecting for. And that, in a nutshell, is the great advantage over natural selection over human-assisted uh, selection. We can never, in our short lifetimes, uh, get it all right. Whereas evolution, with a surplus and abundance of time, has plenty of generations to sort out those mistakes. And that's, that's the difference, okay? That's it right there, time, a, an abundance of time, which allows a species to be shaped by nature, natural selection, uh, to account for all of the extremes that its habitat throws at it. And if it makes a mistake one year, there's plenty of more generations to come that we can correct that mistake. So there is a sort of tension in what I have laid out for you so far tonight. We have nature, which I hope now I've convinced you has conspired to make Apis mellifera have a huge amount of gene diversity in its nest at any given time. Com compared, compared to human selection, which is by necessity, we, we can't help it, is going to be genetically narrow. We may have the character we want, but the allelic cloud of our selected population will be narrower than the allelic cloud of a natural population. So it was this tension that Debbie Delaney and I were interested in because um, we're not here to be um, disruptors. You know, we're, we work in agricultural colleges, right? We're trying to take the best that biology gives us and try to make it reachable and translatable to real farmers and real growers, real citizens who pay their taxes and pay our salaries and, and try to make their agricultural systems better. So we, we, we look at biology and we look at agriculture and we say, how can we have our cake and eat it too? Is there a way that we can take advantage of the rich gains that human breeders have made in varroa mite resistance. Okay, these are not trivial gains. We've got bees that express hygienic behavior. They can detect cells of brood with mites in them and remove them. This is a good thing, we want this. We have bees that have been selected to bite mites. You know, the mite maulers, the anchor by ankle biters, they, Great trade names out there, by the way, for these kinds of things. These are good things. We want them. So how can we integrate this in what the biology of Apis mellifera is teaching us that the bee wants to do? Right. So with instrumental insemination, we can design experiments to ask this kind of question. And Debbie and I were interested in hygienic behavior. We wanted to integrate polyandry with uh, hygienic behavior. Now, and this is a, a one way that you can select for it. Um, you can go out into the field, you can use a, in, this, in these pictures in the top left, we were using a roll of flashing, but it's much easier to use a PVC pipe, like a three inch or even four inch section of PVC pipe. And you screw that into a section of sealed brood and you pour liquid nitrogen into it and that instantly freezes it, like within a minute, it freezes it into a hard circular block of brood that's freeze killed. You see there on the top right. And that freeze killed brood is put into a colony and 24, 24 hours later, you come back and see how much of it they have removed. Um, at the bottom, well, let's go to the bottom left. The bottom left, we have a colony that has removed all of it. This colony is expressing 100% hygienic behavior, so you would want to propagate this trait if that's 
what you were interested in. The colony on the right, on the other hand, has done a mediocre job of removing that freeze-killed brood, so you would probably not want to propagate from this one. And so we, Debbie and I, we uh, got semen, we got uh, colonies that were expressing varroa sensitive hygiene, and these are a hygienic behavior that I just illustrated for you here, but it's aimed at varroa mites in particular. And it is a subset of the general hygienic um, that is more relevant for brood diseases. This is a very particular type of hygienic behavior where the bees have the ability to accurately detect cells that contain a varroa mite and open it and throw it out. This that I've showed you here in this illustration is a field, um, it's a proxy method for a breeder who's interested in trying to propagate the trade. So we, uh, Debbie and I, collected um, drones that carried the VSH stock and drones that were unselected. So we had a wild type unselected drone line and then we had a VSH selected drone line. And this is the diagram that explains our experiment. It's called a two by two factorial. And this is a very powerful design in research when you have two factors, each of which occur at two levels, therefore two by two, and you're interested in just how they behave when they interact with one another. And so Debbie and I had two levels of polyandry, low and high, and we did this with instrumental insemination. In Delaware, she had really bad winter survival of her drone colonies. So we had to have only one drone inseminated per queen with her low level of polyandry. Whereas in Georgia, we had uh, a good survival of our drone colonies. So we were able to give each queen nine drones in the low category. For the high polyandry in Delaware, we had four for the same reason. And in Georgia, we had 54. So this is important to keep in mind. Our lows and our highs were very different when it came to polyandry uh, between Delaware and Georgia. And then of course that semen that we inseminated with was either VSH or wild. So there you have it. Every possible combination of high, low, polyandry, wild type versus VSH. And we um, inseminated uh, wild type virgin queens uh, with these and then put each one of them in a test colony. And here we are the day we actually set this experiment up. It was done in five uh, frame nukes uh, with a super. That's Debbie in the far back left, uh, wearing the dark top and pants. On the immediate left is Kirsten Trainer, whom some of you may recognize. She was a former uh, editor of um, American Bee Journal, and she's now living and working in Germany, and she has started a new magazine called Two Million Blossoms. That's Crispin Given, immediately to, uh, to our left, left of me there in the middle, that's Crispin. I think some of you know Crispin from Purdue. Uh, uh, Crispin's former co-worker, Greg Hunt, and he uh, developed the uh, famous ankle biters, the, the groomer stock. And the rest of that there is, I think some of you know Jennifer Berry, she's waving her white flag there in the back. Jennifer is no stranger to beekeeping in this country. And the rest of them is my crew and helpers. So there you have it. Uh, we set this experiment up in a circle just to minimize or to normalize drift. And then there was a full replicate of this study also conducted in, in Delaware. This is my farm at the University of Georgia. Okay, there you have it. It's a pretty simple design. We inseminated them one of those four different ways, put them out in the field, measured them. So here's, let's go straight to the results. These are the effects of polyandry. All four of these graphs are nothing but low and high polyandry. And remember, Delaware only compared one and four males, whereas in Georgia, we could do nine and 54. Let's start at the top left. Brood, Delaware, significantly more brood with four drones as opposed to one. Georgia, top right, bees, significantly more bees when they're inseminated with 54 drones compared to nine. Comb, Georgia, bottom right, significantly more comb produced in queens inseminated with 54 drones instead of nine. Comb, Delaware, bottom left, same thing, significantly more comb inseminated with four drones compared to one. I love this. 
I really, really eat this up. I mean, think about this. Those of you who have done honeybee selection, you know how hard it is to select and manage and maintain and propagate a breeding program. And so many of these characters, you know, comb production, bee population, and brood, these are important fitness characters. They're important economic characters. And we get results like this with doing nothing more than pumping them full of drones. <laughs> it may be a little more than that. I do have to tell you a quick story. I was in London talking about this, and um, there's this little old man who um, raised his hands and he said, but yes, with those polyandrous queens, won't she pop? Uh, she's thinking about me using the insemination, right? Uh, I do have to make clear, it's a great question, by the way, I do have to make clear that all of our semen doses were the unit, they were uniform. They were all the same volume. But anyway, you get results like this just by simply increasing mating counts. And these are averages across both types of semen, okay? These are legitimate statistical effects of only polyandry. Okay, let's take a look now at VSH. Perhaps not quite as interesting. Delaware brood, no effect. George B population, no effect whether it was VSH or wild comb, no effect. The only effect that was significant was in Delaware for comb production in favor of the wild type semen. And I think this goes straight back to a point I was making earlier that with, with artificial selection programs, we invariably make the population genetically narrower we lose genes. It's called gene attrition. When we lose genes, when we pass them through that bottleneck of human selection without the abundance of time that nature has at its disposal. So I think this is really important for us to realize that we do lose things when we engage in human assisted breeding efforts. Let's take a look at mites and VSH. I hate to say it, it's not very exciting here either, is it? Look, no effect in Delaware nor in Georgia with queens that were inseminated with VSH versus wild type semen. But, and you knew there was a but coming, didn't you? Let's take a look at those interactions. Not in Delaware, but in Georgia, when we went into hyper polyandrous zones, which is represented in 54, we found a significant interaction so that VSH only expressed in those queens that were hyper polyandrous at the 54 rate. There is a very strong theoretical explanation for this, and it comes from a paper that was published in Germany in 1999, which predicted this. But these are the first experimental results to ever show it. We had to wait almost 20 years for that uh, theory to be shown in real life. And this theory predicts that hyperpolyandry, extremely high rates of mating, may be adaptive for those traits that are extremely beneficial plus extremely rare. Now you might think, now wait a minute, why should a trait, if it's really beneficial, why should it also be rare? Well, just so happens that is not the exception, that's the norm across the animal kingdom. The norm, not the exception. Resistance to, to, to high value parasites and predators tends to be recessive genes. And the reason is because it is so potent and it gives such black or white survival benefit that a trait like that can instantly be fixed in a population so that the population is genetically narrow. Okay, the very thing, the very antithesis to what evolution is all about. So in evolution, it has been valuable to make these hyper valuable rare alleles like VSH to make them rare. So if you are a species like the honeybee that can practice polyandry, what are you gonna do? You're gonna mate with lots of males in hopes of catching the one or two that has the brass ring. It's a strategy called an ecology for escaping cliff edge disasters. 
It's for these black or white, either they got it or they don't. They got the trait or they don't. And polyandry is the way honeybees have gone about it to capture those brass rings, if you will, the really good alleles. I expect, I don't know because I've not done the research yet, but I expect this may apply to, um, to things like grooming behavior as well. Those really odd, strange resistance characters are probably going to be rare and recessive in populations. And polyandry is one way to get around that and capture them anyway. Now the real brass ring in biology is none of this stuff. The real brass ring is whether you live or die. So let's cut straight to the real important thing, survival. Okay, let's, let's go down and look, let's, let's look at the top two first. Um, Let's look at the top right one first. And there's a reason why I'm going in this order. For polyandry alone, if we just looked at polyandry, there was no survival benefit. It was a big wash. However, for that group in which polyandry interacted positively with VSH and they were able to go out and capture those brass rings, look what happened at the bottom. It's the red area, by the way that is representing the survivors. Red is good, blue is bad. And look at the highest survival we had across this experiment, was in the VSH queens inseminated with 54 drones. 54 VSH drones it overwhelmingly had the highest survival in this experiment. High enough to in fact tip the overall survival in favor of VSH in the top left. These are really great results, folks. You know, this is showing two really important facts. Number one, for the majority of fitness characters that also have economic significance, brood, bees, and comb production, you get satisfactory results with just simply filling them up with drone semen without any selection for that. We did not select for brood. We did not select for comb. We did not select for large populations. We just got it for free by inseminating our queens with large numbers of males. The second take home from this is in the case of rare, highly beneficial alleles like VSH, polyandry allows the queens to capture those rare alleles and exploit them for her colony's good. We need to incorporate hyperpolyandry with targeted selection. That's tonight's message. Uh, we cannot afford, like uh, the venerables of old, Roger Morse and Steve Tabor, to just sort of write off honeybee qu queen multiple mating, or even worse, apologize for it. No, we need to be incorporating it into our standard breeding practices. That's the end of my prepared talk. Um, maybe we have time to take some questions from the crowd. I will hand that over and, and take the questions as they come to me. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this, if not useful, at least interesting. Um, thank you. Keith, thank you for being with us this evening. We certainly appreciate it. Are there any questions? I'm not seeing anything pop up in the chat box just yet. Let me anticipate some questions. Um, one that I often get is drone saturation areas or more broadly, so what? What can we do about it? Um, I would suggest that one way that breeders can increase polyandry is to start saturating mating yards with drones. Um, we don't know this yet, but we suspect it. It might help. Uh, remember, we're talking about the number of males in the spermatheca. It's not the same thing as the number of males in your neighborhood. We're talking about trying to get it in the spermatheca. Um, another way may be to swap frames of brood around your colonies. In fact, Debbie is really drilling into that. And Debbie's gonna be doing some more work on that. We've done some, Debbie's going to do more. And the idea is if you take brood from one colony and you swap them amongst one another, each queen who mates, let's say with 10 drones, and if you have 10 frames from 10 different queens in one hive box, you could conceivably have 100 patrilines in that nest. 
Now, granted, this would be temporary. They would die from attrition, but at least for that burst of like the peak of your honey season or the peak of your mite growth curve, you could be getting the benefits of polyandry. And then third and finally, I got to throw this out there because it's such a fun idea. Um, there's a very good chance that um, promiscuity might be something we can select for. Imagine that, selecting for queens who just naturally on their own mate with lots of males. And if we have, if we have interesting um, um, merchandising names when it comes to malt, mite maulers and ankle biters, imagine what people would think up for a queen like that. So um, there you go. I'll let others ask questions now. <laughs> All right. So we have one here. It says, for the open mating, how far should the drone hives be located? They should be on top of your mating yards. That is a fiction. The idea that you need to separate them, get that out of your head. Uh, in fact, polyandry is yet another adaptation for that or against that risk. Uh, a average drone congregation area, as I said earlier, has about 200 colonies represented in it. And it, by extension, will include, I promise you, it will include uh, males from your target colony. Nature knows this. Uh, it's unavoidable. And polyandry is yet one more adaptation to, to account for that. You, think about it. If she gets one unsavory mating, you know, if she mates with a brother, you know, there's going to be plenty of others in her spermatheca to negate that effect. So don't worry about it. It's far more important to pack your mating yards with drones so that you are making big drone congregation areas. Thank you. Um, another question. In a natural situation, you mentioned that a large percentage of the multiple drone sperm is wasted. Question. Therefore, how random is the sperm in your spermatheca? Uh, for example, does the sperm of each drone cluster together or is it a true random mix for her to fertilize individual eggs? Superb question. Uh, and it is one that has been addressed multiple times because it is such an important question. There is a small number of studies that are quite old from the 50s and 60s that suggested that there was layering. I want to make it very clear that the vast majority of evidence since has shown that a queen is sampling all of her mates at any given time. The, 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 the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of expressing all of the males at one time, which makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, if, if any of this is real, then it's, it's in the colony's um, uh, benefit to have all of those patra lines expressing all of the time. Okay. Uh, another question from Hudson. Black queen cell virus is attributed to queens mating with drones too closely related? I guess that's the question. Is it attributed? You know, I don't know. Uh, honestly, I, I don't know specifically. Uh, generally, I would say probably. I mean, it makes sense. If I had to guess one or the other, I would say that that statement is true. Um, but that's just simply owing to the fact that inbreeding is never a good idea. But I still think that multiple mating is still going to solve problems like that. It's, it's a, the only time we see real serious inbreeding issues is in remote apiaries in which there has been little or no effort to propagate diversity. Uh, I have personally seen apiaries like that, where there is a high degree of inbreeding. Uh, in this case, it came from beekeeper who um, only requeened with brood from that apiary. And the way he would, you know, oh gosh, darn, this colony just lost its queen. Well, let me just go over here and get out a frame of brood from this hive. And he puts it in this one. And he did that for like 40 years. And that was one sorry apiary. Um, it's, in, it's in extreme situations like that, that it's a problem. All right, question from Mark. Would it be better to encourage drones from VSH queen hives to increase VSH in colonies or raise daughter queens from VH, VSH queens? 
uh, ultimately it makes no difference. Um, it is a, you know, it's a biallelic trait. So you're going to want its expression at a high level of recessive homozygosity. And I'm throwing some terms out here. What you want to make hygiene express, you want it to be on the maternal and paternal side. Okay, you want them because it is a recessive alleles. So if it's going to express, you've got to have both of them in the same individual from the father, from the mother. So the answer is all of the above. You want the males carrying it, you want the, the queens carrying it. Okay, here's another question. Here's my problem. I have purchased a specialty queen. She swarms. The virgin queen mates with all of the West Virginia drones with no skills. <laughs> now I'm down to 50% of desired traits. They swarm again now down to 25% of desired traits. Yes. What am I left with? The problem is not specialty breed bred queens. The problem is saturation. Is that practical? Well, the problem is that, that, that nature has conspired against you and me and all of us. Um, nature does not want those traits to be dominant and they will not be dominant. They, they will not. Um, whether it's hygiene or whether it's, it's uh, ankle biting, this is the great frustration why we have to keep, we have to keep importing new germplasm to keep these specialty traits up and running. And, and hyperpolyandry is an attempt to get away from that bondage. And you see how it is a bondage. And, and the hyperpolyandry is simply equipping the queen to go out and find those brass rings because polyandry at a normal rate doesn't cut it. So it, it's, it's a real example of where we need to interface these two streams of knowledge, hyperpolyandry with targeted selection. Until that happens, these recessive alleles, they're going to erode away and nothing will ever change that. Alrighty, let's see here. Isn't that irony? I mean, think <laughs> about it. I know we, we, we as human, again, in our brief lifetimes, we look at that and say, you know, what the heck? You know, why, why should it be? Well, that's why, because fixation is lethal. If you get a colony that all it does is express VSH, that's lethal. They can't survive. They're going to jettison all their brood. And it happens. And it's also costly for them to maintain these behaviors if there is no parasite. So that's another reason why evolution has made those characters rare and recessive. I know it's crazy, but that's in evolutionary time, it's a winning strategy. All right. What kind of pressure has the widespread use of miticides had on queen multiple mating as a strategy? Ooh, I think one of the, that, that's, a, that's a hard question, a hard hitting one. If I were to guess, I would think kind of back to that sperm quantity problem, because we do have really good data from the synthetic acaricides. I don't know, I don't have it in my head about the organic acids, but I do know the synthetic acaricides really hammer the sperm counts. And this, of course, goes against everything I'm talking about, doesn't it? So I, I do think that that is a risk. I, I would love to see some research on the organic acids, you know, oxalic, thymol, um, formic, and those, and see how those affect male um, sperm count. Incidentally, that problem is not unique to APIS, guys. You've been reading that paper came out in the New England Journal, I guess, worldwide men. Uh, our sperm counts are going down too. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's not <laughs> unique to the honeybees. Heaven help us. Um, Hudson says, probably an unrelated question, but do you believe the, a queen can lay a larger fertilized egg in a queen cell if eggs vary in size? You know, I don't know. I know um, egg size has been a target of inquiry of whether that transpires into better queens or not. And there is some variation you know, some eggs are larger than others, but I, I, I frankly don't know. I'm not up on that literature. I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I'm kind of slow on that one. Okay. Are there any other questions, folks?
Uh, so John says, I don't think we are really ready for a human drone congregation area yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a science fiction book for you. 